Hi everyone, welcome to State of the Consumer, feeling the pinch this back to school season. As you may have noticed, I am not Matt Britton. Due to unforeseen circumstances, Matt is unfortunately unable to join us today. But for those of you who don't know me, I am Katie Gross, Chief Customer Officer here at Suzy, and I'm excited to take you through an exciting presentation today about how parents are feeling about back to school spending. And I'm delighted to have two fantastic guests, Rick and Ben, who will be introducing themselves shortly. So for those of you who are new to Suzy, we partner with hundreds of the world's top brands by offering integrated quant, qual, and high quality audiences into a single connected research cloud. And for today's presentation, we ran a study with a thousand American parents from children through kindergarten through to college. And to help me tell the story today, we have two experts on all things back to school. So I'll let them introduce themselves and let them tell you a little bit about their background. So Ben, we'll start with you. Sure. Um, ben Lepsey, uh, work for Walmart within our customer insights and strategy team. Uh, and I focus solely on seasonal insights. So uh, really focusing on total box reporting, but mainly for these um, seasonal occasions like back to school or winter holiday, um, as well as other you know holidays that, that fall within the calendar year. Awesome. I've been with Walmart for around four years now and uh, came to Walmart from uh, uh, Decision Insight, did some CPG research there, um, a lot of brand work, new packaging tests, things like that, but uh, broader consumer research. Great. Thanks, Ben, for joining us. And over to you, Rick. Hi there. My name is Rick Stringer. I am the Senior Vice President for the Global Consumer and Customer Leadership Center at Crayola, which is essentially all consumer, shopper, category marketplace insights um katie this is my 17th back to school so as an adult <laughs> <laughs> well congratulations rick <laughs> yes thank you yeah i've been with crayola now for uh just about 22 years prior to that i spent some time in uh, cpg in health and beauty care uh over the counter pharmaceuticals so uh, pleased to be here Thanks for having us. Wonderful. And I was just sharing with Rick that I went to the Crayola experience in East Pennsylvania last week. It is fabulous for anybody who wants to attend. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So as we all know, back to school season is upon us and some parts of the country are already starting to go back and everybody else is busy shopping for those must have items. And in fact, back to school is the second biggest shopping season of the year for retailers behind the winter holidays. Many see this as an early indicator of the momentum ahead for the rest of the year. So, first of all, we want to know how are parents feeling about this? So, if we have a look at what the media has to say, things are not looking up. We're hearing that parents are stressed about ongoing inflation, that they're dreading spending their, sending their kids back to school, and that they're looking for more savings than ever before. But we had to ask ourselves, is this really the full picture? And actually what we found is that it's not. The truth is that the parents are feeling pretty good about going back to school. And the number one emotion that parents expressed about kids is happiness. And they're actually excited. So this brings us into what the three of us are going to be digging into for the rest of today, taking the headlines into account, but also asking parents using the Suzy platform and bringing in trending data from TikTok. We're going to look beyond just the headlines and uncover the full picture for the back to school season. So taking what we're already seeing and what we know from the media, we're adding in real parent data to get the full picture. But before we dig a little bit deeper there, Ben and Rick, I'd love to hear from each of you, your thoughts on this topic. Any immediate thoughts? Mm. Rick, ben, maybe you want we'll to lead us off? Uh, oh, sure, yeah, I'll be happy to start. Um, you know, the, the thing about back to school that's so interesting, and, and we tend to look at it at Crayola primarily through supplies and with supplies, uh, the elementary grades. So pre-kindergarten through fourth, fifth, sixth grade, you know, it's one of the rare occasions in the U.S. where so many households are required to buy so many of the same items at the exact same time. And we've got some great partners where we understand you know, what teachers put on their list, why they put those items, where they're, why they're important. And 
Katie, you mentioned up front the excitement. You know, kids like it because they get new stuff. <laughs> and we do know, you know, 60% plus do bring the kids along. There's an emotional connection to getting your child ready. They want to send them back happy and healthy. And I think we continue to see that as we dive into both qualitative and quantitative uh, data as they prepare for the start of the new school year. Absolutely takes me back. I was always very excited to get back to school. <laughs> and Ben, do you have any immediate thoughts? Yeah, I think <clears throat> kind of the dis distinction between what you're seeing in headlines and, and your call outs around happiness and excitement, I think it speaks to, you know, consumers just being cognizant of current events and, and current struggles, managing their budgets and, and inflation. Um, but at the same time, I think August and kind of the return to school is, is a return to their typical routines and a little more structure for families. And so I think there's excitement and eagerness among parents to get back to that routine. Um, but at the same time, ev everyone is dealing with inflation right now and, and managing your back to school budget is, is part of that. So I'm um, happy to dig into the data further here. Yeah, excited. All right. So for this webinar, we're gonna look at the full picture about what parents, where parents are shopping, what they're buying and what their biggest concerns are. So first off, where are the parents shopping this back to school season? So the headlines are telling us that parents are experiencing digital fatigue and doing their shopping in store, not online. And there are lots of examples of this. The one here on the screen is from Deloitte and it shows that digital channels are reaching a saturation point due to an increase in parents in store spending and a decrease in online. But when we look at the full picture, what do we see? While parents do indeed prefer to do their back to school shopping in person, online still plays a key role in influencing those in-store purchases. So before we move on, Ben, I'd love to hear your thoughts. What types of shopper patterns are you seeing in store versus online channels? Yeah, I think anymore we're really seeing back to school. Uh, it's really an omni journey for customers. Uh, the majority of that research and planning actually occurs online. Um, before they actually start shopping and, and purchasing, converting on those items. Um, so that's kind of the importance of, of really thinking about it from a, you know, a customer centric lens uh, to make sure that it really feels like a seamless experience. Um, you know, Rick called out and, and the, data here, um, the data here itself speaks to the in-store preference for a conversion, but a lot of that planning happens on, online beforehand. So uh, that's an important call out. We've also seen people use social media as almost kind of a new um, approach to reviews and, and genuine feedback from others. Um, so I think that's that's how social may be evolving when you think about some of these back to school um, shopping occasions as well. Yeah, we have a lot of great data coming up on that topic. <laughs> Rick, what about yourself? What are your thoughts on the on yeah, where shopping? I think Ben really hit the, the nail on the head here. Um, What's interesting, because when you're given a list of very specific supplies to purchase, it's very easy for the consumer and the shopper now to compare prices across different retailers, different banners, different formats. And one thing we saw, you know, we started kind of kicking the tires with consumers and shoppers in May to kind of get a sense of where is this season going to play out. And one thing we observed was that because of all the media attention around inflation, gas prices were soaring it was very clear that deals and pricing were going to be the two key drivers. Traditionally, it's convenience for back to school supplies. This year, um, price and deals are trumping and the shoppers are very much engaged in that pre path to purchase research to understand where the best deals are. Yeah, that's a really interesting point. So let's have a look at what the data says from our consumers. So it is true that 73% of parents prefer to do their back to school shopping in person and 83% of those intend to do it at mass retailers, such as Walmart. This is versus 44% who plan to do it in online retailers. But just because they're buying in store, as Ben rightly said, does not mean they're not being influenced. So naturally we went over to TikTok for some deeper insights and using TikTok insights, we found that online channels, particularly social media, are very influential when it comes to back to school purchasing decisions. And in fact, 81% of TikTok users said that the platform played a role in their purchasing decisions in this particular category. 
So what's really interesting about TikTok in particular is that it has the power to influence both the kids and the parents. And we know that TikTok is very heavily associated with Gen Z and kids going back to school. What we actually found from TikTok Insights is that nearly a third of the platform's users are parents of school-aged children. So TikTok really has the power to tap into both those parents and the children that are making those decisions when they're going back to school in this particular season. And so the so what of this particular section is that people are looking to social media as a complement to physical stores, not as a competitor. So Ben, what are your thoughts on how social media is playing a, a significant role this school season with the, both those parents and with those children? I mean, I, th I think we've seen a lot of parents um, turn to social. And and I think there is a little difference when you look at other social media platforms, um, you know, for example, like Facebook versus something like TikTok. Um, you know, we see more activity on Facebook looking for reviews and kind of genuine, authentic product feedback. It's that's where we see more conversations happen among parents. TikTok really brings the excitement um, almost of an in-store experience and being able to see those products, see the joy um, and happiness on, on those consumers' faces. Um, so I think they're almost being used for, for different purposes. Um, but again, you know, even TikTok ex itself can be used to kind of pull consumers back into store um, if that's the, where they want to shop. So I, I think it it definitely contributes to this loop in terms of where consumers are, are seeking information uh, before they actually go out and are, are, are ready to purchase. Yeah, for sure. And Rick, what about your thoughts? Yeah, it is interesting because I think, I think what, to Ben's point, um, TikTok can amplify a micro event, a promotion very quickly and have a lot of influence with the community within the community. Uh, I think about teachers. You know, teachers are arguably the savviest shoppers you'll ever run across. They're always thinking about their classroom. You know, the average teacher spending over $300 a year they know how to find deals. And what we saw this year, early season, teachers were communicating via TikTok, sharing the deals. The joy of sharing with other teachers <laughs> was amplified through that. And, and I think as we think about it as CPG professionals, the more you can engage a shopper at point of purchase to want to share the joy of a deal, of a great display, of a great assortment, I think that's very powerful. And I think as we think about it as merchandisers, as merchants, as marketers, there's something very powerful there. And these micro influencers and even organic videos that aren't influencers that just want to share it is a very interesting area to be uh, taking a look at as we think about the future as we plan for next year as well. Yeah, that's a really good point. I know that people talk a lot about kind of doom scrolling with social media, but you just mentioned it's joy scrolling potentially. Yeah. Um, all right, so we're going to close up this section with an example of a brand that's done a really good job of integrating their online um, and their in-store presence. So Claire's, definitely a favorite of mine when I was going back to school, does tons of back-to-school comms on TikTok that focuses on the joys of that in-person shopping and really encourages viewers to go back into those retail stores. This is a really nice example of exactly that. So next up, what we're going to be looking at is what a parent's buying this back to school season. So let's first of all, look at the headlines. The headlines are telling us that they're cutting back on back to school shopping and only buying the necessities. And headlines include stories of families that are struggling to make some of these new purchases. But that fuller picture tells a slightly different story. So while most parents are indeed planning on sticking to those essentials this year, the definition of what is essential is definitely broadening. So over half of parents are just planning on buying essentials this year, but what exactly are they now considering essential when it comes to back to school shopping? So if we look at the hashtag school essentials on TikTok, Gen Z deems all kinds of things essential from headphones to breast strips, to brow kits, to film cameras. There is a significant amount that is now being viewed as school essentials. So that's not to say that parents are going to buy all of these things, but we can see that parents are being influenced by their children and the things they're seeing on social media, which is pushing them into overspending. And the number one thing that parents are spending money on this season is clothes. So on average, they're spending $263 on clothes this back to school season, and this excludes shoes. 
they're actually spending more than this if you factor shoes in. So the interesting thing about clothes in particular is that essential doesn't equate, equate to minimal. It's important not to conflate those because clothes are an essential back to school item and kids do need them to go back to school, but consumers aren't just sticking with the bare minimum when it comes to buying these clothes. And the back to school haul hashtag has over 68 million mm. views on TikTok. It is filled with consumers showing off all of their new clothes that they're getting in preparation of back to school. And it's interesting that when parents say that they're buying the essentials, it definitely does not mean the bare minimum. So the so what here is not to underestimate that what consumers consider to be back to school essentials definitely is not necessarily our previous thoughts on what essential meant. So Rick and Ben, love to hear your thoughts here. Is any of this data surprising to you? Ben, we'll start with you. I know that Walmart sells a lot of college door yeah. microphones and of course closing. I mean, I think we expected um, a, a, an uptick in apparel. Um, I, I think when you think about essentials, you also have to consider the past few years and how consumers have responded to changes in instruction format, being at home with virtual learning, then being back in classrooms. So I think part of the apparel shopping is kids kids are always growing so they need new new apparel and clothing on top of that you know it may be um you know filling in some of those gaps from from the past couple of years um at the same time school supplies kids always need those items on the list um i think that's where um you know students are expecting to to buy those core school supplies that's what we usually think of when we talk about essentials um but it's a great call out that kids need more than just school supplies it's apparel um, even when you get into some of the, you know, the, the older, um, you know, middle school, high school, you think about beauty products as well. It just, so the, yeah. the category lists expand kind of based on the, the age of the student, um, and, and factoring in, you know, what the past couple of years have looked like with, um, COVID and, and now inflation. Yeah. And have you seen any particular shifts in college students going back to college or just starting college? Anything with college... Like I think that's where maybe not so much on the apparel front, but with technology, um, it's almost, you know, we've almost seen this trade off between back to school and, and back to college, back to back to school. We saw this boom with, um, you know, digital learning where students were really needing, you know, laptops, tablets and things over the past couple of years. Granted, um, schools have been rushing to kind of fill that void um, to get to a to a one to one student to device ratio. Um, we expect that to kind of revert back to traditional um, learning now being in classrooms, but for the back to college crowd, um, that digital focus still persists. Um, the majority of them have purchased laptops in the past, so it may not be um, the full laptop refresh for a lot of these incoming freshmen or, or upperclassmen, um, but we are seeing um, you know, them lean into um, tech and electronic accessories, um, as well as some of those furniture um, and home decor, because again, if they've been living at home, that may be a different, you know, living space or situation for them this year. So yeah. again, not to revert back to COVID and inflation shifts, but I think it, it's, it's important to keep in mind what the past couple of years have looked like and kind of how we're, um, how the trend may be shifting, um, this year moving forward. Yeah, for sure. Um, so would you, Rick, um, in relation to the topic of essentials versus minimums, um, what do you, what are the trends that you're seeing? Yeah, you know, we definitely have seen specific to our space of school supplies, um, the core essentials, the, the great value are definitely growing faster than what, what I would call more of your basket builder items. But what's interesting is the basket builder items are growing too. Mm -hmm. And the total category in the segment is actually up year to date. Um, and what I trace a little bit of this back to, Katie, is if you really look at trends in education, we're starting to see a lot of districts implement social and emotional learning curriculum. Yeah. And the idea of sending your child back to school with confidence and ensuring socially they're ready is, is in play. And I think there are items that can help a parent bring that to life for their child. And, you know, maybe I'm stretching it a little bit here, but the choice of what they want what they wear, um, giving them that confidence, I think is very important. And those are essential to parents as they think about getting their child ready. Yeah, so a really good point. I think you know the, the 
as we already saw, happiness is, is what they want for their children as well. Right. So I think it's a really interesting point. All right, so to close out this section, we're gonna look um, at back to school makeup hashtag, which has over 29 million views. There's a whole host of consumers that are describing back to school must haves, makeup for the ninth grade and back to school essentials. So the cosmetics industry isn't the one that we'd immediately think about when talking about back to school and then makeup was banned at my high school. So we'd always sneak the mascara in. <laughs> what we're definitely seeing is that essentials go way beyond the traditional pencils and laptop cases that we really tend to think about. So moving into that final section uh, for today, what are parents' biggest concerns this back to school season? So let's first of all, again, look at the headlines and the headlines are pointing to inflation as the biggest concern. And there are tons and tons of articles around this exact topic. But that full picture tells us something slightly different. So while it's true that parents are indeed concerned about rising prices, it's not necessarily the parents' top priority or concern. So yes, 64% of parents do feel that their shopping has been greatly impacted by inflation What's really interesting is that 77% of parents feel confident that they can still afford everything that their child needs. And actually, the cost of school supplies isn't even in the parents' top three considerations or concerns. So when we asked parents about the hardest parts of sending their kids back to school, the top two were school safety and COVID safety. And parents were also slightly more likely to say missing their kids um, while they were at school was slightly harder for them than the cost of school supplies. I was one of four. I'm pretty sure my parents did not say missing their kids was going to be a concern. <laughs> um, but great to hear that it is uh, the top three concerns for parents. So Rick, I understand that you have some data around this topic as well. Can you tell us a little bit more about what you're seeing in this area? Yeah, we, we asked a few questions of this and we broadened ours a little bit to understand the, the social and the emotional side of things. And, and I do think, you know, the social interaction, especially when you think about elementary grades and what families and households went through through COVID, kids were essentially at home, fewer choices of what they could do experientially. They weren't in the classroom. They're having to learn through laptops. I do think that there was a stunt in that emotional growth for kids. And I do think parents, it's top of mind for them. Obviously, their safety and what has happened in the media on both fronts, both with COVID, but also just general safety in the classroom are big players. But how their kids are interacting with other children, are they developing socially? is as much of importance to them as their academic growth. And I think those two are going to go hand in hand. And I think it's going to be a bit of a challenge for teachers because teachers are going to have to think about that as well. And, you know, when you think about the teachers too, we've seen and read a lot about teacher burnout, you know, the revolving door. I've seen anywhere, you know, four to 6% um, um, out of service. I do think we're going to feel the torque and the stress of that as we go through the academic school year this year. And it'll be interesting to see how all of that plays out. Yeah. And I know the government, if you look at just the um, amount of federal funding, you know, over $130 billion in funding has funneled into schools. And a big portion of what we track is, again, going to social and emotional learning for kids from kindergarten all the way through 12th grade. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And Ben, do you have any thoughts on this kind of key area around parents' concerns for back to school? Yeah, I think, um, I mean, from the social aspect, when I saw that happy and excited being kind of the first two things that, that um, you know, Susie saw in the data in, in terms of how parents were feeling, that's kind of what I thought of is they're excited for their kids to be back in classrooms, socializing with other students. Yeah. And also not having to do it themselves, you know, multitasking as 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 parents. Um, the the inflation piece, I think inflation is is something that all consumers are working through um, pretty much at all times. I mean, it's not inflation is not mission or trip specific, so it's something that I think they're having to accept and deal with. Um, and also for back to school and back to college, I mean, those are decisions. Back to school, those students are are going back to classrooms. Back to college, that's a decision those families make on the front end. 
But once that decision is made, all the items they need are essentially seen as a necessity. And, and parents find ways to cover those items, either pulling back in other areas, saving on the front end. And Rick, we've also talked about, you know, searching for those deals and promotions yeah. and comparing price points. Um, I think that's partially why we saw a little bit of an earlier start in some of the back to school shopping this year is parents trying to get out in front of it. Um, but I don't want to breeze past, you know, seeing the concerns around COVID and the concerns around school safety, because I think, again, it reintroduces that element of uncertainty, which has been so painful for parents the past couple of years. Um, even when students did go back in the classroom, then they had to go back to this hybrid or, or from home format. Um, that's just one more juggling act that, that I don't think parents are, um, you know, interested in handling this year. So um, we'll, we'll see where it nets out with, you know, different COVID variants and whatnot. But um, I think, you know, school supplies, that's something parents know are coming um and and they're prepared to pay for that they they feel they're going to pay more due to inflation um but they've accepted that yeah you know i'd make another point too katie um we were tracking a lot around vacations and most of the data we gathered would suggest that families with kids were in fact going to take a vacation this summer that was still important even though gas was you know five dollars a gallon etc that experiential side of family time together, the traditional summer vacation has definitely been in play. And what's interesting, we ran a survey in late July and 41% of households that we surveyed, and this was broad based, 2000 plus aligned with regions, 41% had not started shopping for back to school supplies. That was up 700 basis points versus prior year about the same time. So we were a little surprised by that based on the fast start that we saw in June and July for school supplies. And as we dove into it a little bit more, we did find out that, hey, they were buying this stuff, not just for school, <laughs> but for immediate consumption during the summer, which is an added benefit of some of these products and how they do benefit um, households and just their day to day. Interesting. Yeah, absolutely. All right, so let's have a look at some of the top ways that parents are planning to make purchases to keep their kids safe. And many of those ways are through hand sanitizers and face masks. So thank you for Michelle in the audience for asking that in the chat. We've got a lot of data coming up for you there. Ben, are you seeing some of these purchases too in, in Walmart? Yeah, and I think the, the COVID concerns, um, COVID fatigue is very real. I think we all feel it, but at the same time, um, especially sending your children to school, I think this is something that people will be aware of and um, have almost been conditioned to, to, to think about um, and shop for those items. I mean, we see sanitizer, cleaning, disinfectants, things like that on, on school lists. Um, we've also seen teachers reach out and, and add those as, you know, a request to, to their classrooms. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, so we may not be in lockdown, but again, just based on the past couple of years that, that we've lived through, I think this is something that people are, are, you know, conditioned to be aware of and, and think about when they're sending their kids um, back to classrooms. Yeah, for sure. And parents in our research also said that the number one that uh, parents are ensuring they can afford back to school shopping, as we've mentioned, waiting for those deals and those promotions. Um, so we've talked a little bit already about kind of the timing of when they're shopping. Are parents waiting for deals? Are they shopping earlier? Um, ben, what kind of uh, patterns are you seeing um, on your side? I mean, everything we're seeing in the data is that parents were really seeking these deals, promotions, discounts. Mm -hmm. I think what's interesting is it felt like the retailers really led with these discounts early. Um, I think, you know, with some of the availability concerns that seem to be more so coming from consumers than, than the actual retailers and their supply chain um, issues themselves. I think retailers led with these deals early um because they knew that customers were going to be price sensitive and really seeking that that uh, the best value and the lowest price for the items and to rick's point earlier 
this is really the one time in the year where everyone gets a school list with the same items. So it, with it being so easy to price compare anymore, um, you know, especially all that being done online, um, I think that's where we saw consumers, you know, respond early in the season and, and you know, start their shopping earlier than than maybe what we've seen in, in past years. Yeah, that's great. So of course, our very own guest speakers, Walmart and Crayola, have deals. They're going to help to uh, <laughs> to ease that burden um, for all of the parents. And while, of course, overall, parents' top priority is going to be safety, um, even when we break down priorities at a product level, price still isn't the top priority. It's actually quality that came out on top. So the so what here is that even in the midst of a financial crisis, brands don't just need to talk to parents about saving money. It's easy to look at the headlines about inflation and lean heavily into sales and heavily into saving money, but that's not all that parents want to hear about. So as we mentioned earlier, school safety is a top priority for parents and is a big conversation topic on TikTok. So this has proven to be an opportunity to small businesses in particular, as they're appealing to parents by selling lots of protective, protective products from self-defense keychains to COVID hand sanitizer and more here. So 15.2 million views on Keep Our Children Safe um, on TikTok. And it's also important to note that not all brands feel that they can or need to talk to school safety. Maybe it's not within their remit, and I think it's important to see that brands can still show that they care about children's well-being. So looking at the gap, for example, they have shown that they're putting kids right at the heart of their whole campaign, focusing on diversity and inclusion and the notion that everybody belongs. And it's refreshing to see that even in this time of a financial crisis, that kids' well-being is still and always will be the parents' number one priority. So we looked at where parents are shopping this back to school season and found that the headlines are telling us that it's all in store. But what we found is that online is actually playing a key role in influencing purchases and that brands should look at social media as a complement to those physical stores, not as a competitor. And let's have a look at what the parents are buying this season. So the headlines were telling us that parents are cutting back and sticking only to the bare necessities. And while that is true, what we are concluding is that we're definitely seeing that the definition of essentials is broadening. Brands should not underestimate the consumers consider what consumers consider to be essential. Uh, it's definitely growing um, and that we need to make sure we're satisfying their appetite for the products that aren't strictly connected just to the classroom. And finally, we look at the parents' biggest concerns this season. The headlines were telling us that parents are extremely concerned about inflation, but actually this isn't parents' number one priority. Even in the midst of this financial crisis, brands should be careful not just to talk to parents about saving money. So in our last couple of minutes for today, I'd love to chat about what some of these key implications are going to mean for retailers. So Rick, in kind of in conclusion, is there anything in this data that was surprising to you? And how do you think year this year's kind of in-store and online key items compared to the uh, pre-back to school shopping predictions? Yeah, I, I think this year we're going, we're it's going to be a two wave, the bookends. It was a fast start. I thought, and you know, over the last couple of weeks, things have settled a bit. I think we're to the point now where the reality of my kids have to go back to school. I have to get them prepared. And I think the point about the essentials of back to school are more than just a new pair of shoes, a couple of outfits and the school supplies. Um, I think it really touches what Ben started with is that return to normalcy and in this year, especially, it's a return to true normalcy pre-COVID, I believe, is going to be a big play. So my expectation would be we'll see growth. Um, yeah. I think we're going to see a second wave here that's going to hit. And I do think once you're back in school, anticipate a couple of bounce back trips as well. As parents, you know, they miss this item or that item. We always know that once they go back to school, the teacher requests, their wish list, those extra needs they have come into play. So I'm pretty optimistic about the season in general. And despite the doom and gloom of inflation, I do believe parents want to send their kids back with confidence and have them ready to go. And uh, it'll prove to be a, a pretty good season when the dust settles. Yeah, awesome. Have you noticed any items that are becoming more or less popular in the community? 
Um, we need a little time to see where the dust settles as far as the list. We, we tend to focus mainly on back to school supplies. There's a lot of list analysis that we have in play to understand what is on the list, what's not. I anticipate uh, earphones, earbuds will play a role as we balance the digital with the physical in the classroom. I think um, your basic supplies to help the teacher fund her or his, his room will be a play as well. But um, it's still a little early for me yet to make a judgment call on anything that's really popped that's new outside what we normally see. Yeah, absolutely. And um, for a brand like yours, how do you leverage platforms like TikTok in your own marketing campaigns? Or what do you keep? A, how do you keep a close eye on the TikTok trends? Yeah, we, we definitely keep an eye on, on what's in play there. There are some um, uh, influencers that we turn to for that, but we also know the quality of our brand, the emotional connection we have, the nostalgia naturally plays, and we get a lot of organic um, support for our brand because of the love of Crayola, and that works very hard for us. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and so, Ben, um, from your perspective, uh, how are you leveraging to, uh, platforms like TikTok and your own marketing and how are you leveraging those influences? I think it goes back to just a lot of the comments around social media. I mean, it for mm -hmm. us, it's all about meeting the customers where they are. And as we've seen customers, you know, both parents as well as younger, you know, even high school students, so we've seen them move to those platforms. Um, you know, we're definitely investing there, uh, partnering with influencers, um, to bring them relevant content, you know, it's important for us to drive digital traffic. Um, you know, not, not only Walmart, I think in this day and age for all retailers. Um, so that's part of it. If that's where the, the customers are and that's where they're looking for input and feedback on certain items, um, and they have, you know, feedback they can share on that personal experience, um, that adds a little excitement and, 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 um, you know, you, you see it in the numbers. Um, consumers are clearly clearly seeking that information and engaging with it. So, yeah, absolutely. Um, and from your perspective, for for Walmart, are there any items you're seeing yet if, that are more or less popular this year versus previous years? Um, we always have favorable Crayola products, Rick. Um, you know, <laughs> I think we've seen customers really lean in there. That's one where. Um, you know, it's interesting to see, we always see Crayola items requested on, on a lot of these core lists. Um, you know, I think we have seen um, an investment in, in a lot of our private label um, mm -hmm. products on, on the stationery and back to school, really those core list products as well. Um, private label has been a big investment for us. And I think, you know, consumers have responded to that favorably. Um, kind of thinking back to your quality and price um, importance slide. I think customers want to know that the product works and that it functions appropriately. As long as you're able to check that box, I think that's when price comes in. Um, so it's it's really that that trade off of what value customers are seeking. And and that's where I think we've Walmart has done a great job stepping in with our private label um, to really provide um, another avenue of cost savings for for our customers. Yeah. And are you creating any kind of different shopping experience in store versus online? I think the goal for us is really for it to feel like a, a seamless shopping experience. Um, mm -hmm. You know, we do see a lot of customers utilizing the app, even when they come in store to actually convert and purchase those items. Um, you know, at the end of the day, it's it's naturally going to feel like a little bit of a different experience, uh, brick and mortar versus online. Um, but I think that's that's where we're headed is trying to make it feel like a seamless journey, regardless of whether you're planning online beforehand and then actually shopping and converting in store or whether you're just adding those items to cart and, and fulfilling that list online. Yeah. Yeah. I think, Ben, you make a really good point there. And, you know, Katie, if you think about it, if you've let's say you've got a child that's in first grade and third grade and sixth grade the average back to school supply list has about 14, 15 items. So right there, that's 45 items you have to go find in a section. And, you know, we, we've seen the segmentation work. There are shoppers that say, 
I want to avoid this at all costs. So a, a service like a, a, a click two buttons, your list is online at Walmart. Walmart will fulfill it. Now you have to think about the store associate that actually has the burden of <laughs> picking all of those items to fulfill the list. And I think if you we view this with empathy for the shopper, okay, you've got to get all these items. How do they shop? How do they walk it? How do you ensure you've got the base items, but give them some trade up options? Um, how do you bring fun into that, but also the pragmatic side? In, in one respect, if you love merchandising, it's probably one of the great merchandising challenges, right? You've got all these different segments. How do you make it easy? How do you scream value? How do you drive trade up? And I, I just think that that's the, the, the beauty of back to school. When you look at it from our eyes as professionals in CPG and merchandising, those solutions, delighting that shopper, they leave the store excited with their kids versus stressed out. Um, it always makes for a very challenging planning session. And uh, it's very exciting. Yeah, you raise such an important point because 47 items could be a scavenger hunt if it's not merchandised well. Yes. yes. <laughs> so for sure. We're getting some so if questions. anybody's in stores this week, because this week is traditionally peak week for back to school supplies. Yeah, just stand in a in a in a Walmart back to school supply section <laughs> and uh, observe. <laughs> it's it's always very interesting, right, Ben? <laughs> Yeah. It, hey, and you're picking a good week. You should have a fair amount of traffic to observe. So this this would be the time to do it. Great for people watching, <laughs> for <Yes>. sure. <laughs> We're getting some questions coming in from the audience, which is fantastic. Thank you. Um, ben, you'd mentioned micro influencers earlier, and the audience is asking, what do you look for in micro influencers to partner with? Ooh, that's a tough one. Um, I think I think you're looking for people who feel credible, they feel genuine, they feel that there's a relevance tied to the message or the content that that you're trying to share. Um, I think that's probably, you know, priority one for us. Um, you know, on top of that, there's there's a lot of guardrails um, and, and hoops you have to jump through. Um, but I think we want to be sure we're partnering with influencers who A, have an audience that that you know they'll help the Walmart brand reach, uh, but then on top of that, just being credible, being relevant. Um, I think where influencers can really play a role is is carrying your your brand forward, but you don't want it to feel like it's commissioned by Walmart, or or you don't want it to feel like a sales pitch. And so it's finding that balance of authenticity. Um, and that's why I think it's so important to partner with the right influencers who, you know, the message that they have to share on that topic, um, it, you know, it's relevant and speaks volumes and carries weight. Yep. I think you're right. right on, Ben. Authenticity. I think, you know, consumers can make a split second decision and that's about all the time you have to build that. And that trust is so, so important. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, we're getting a few folks question. Um, so Rick earlier you mentioned it's a little too soon to start to see um, what those key trends have been for the season. And somebody asked the question, how how early do you start to do your predictive research? Um, somebody did actually ask what tools you're using to do the research. And of course, Susie being one of them. But folks are asking a little bit more about how you stay ahead of the trends and, and conduct that research through this very, uh, this very important time for you. Yeah, I think part of it is understanding the way teachers plan their list. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they start to, to shut the classroom down or they start thinking about the next year really in May. And if you think about Teacher Appreciation Week, which is the first week of May, that's always an interesting time to maybe celebrate what teachers do and also start getting them to think a little bit about planning their classroom for the following year. But I would say that's always a good time to reach out to teachers to understand is there anything new popping on their lists? What are their key concerns? Um, most lists are populated in May and June. We do know this year um, through a partner teacherlist.com that they did see an increase in lists uploaded in May and June, double digit. So I think we'll continue to see that trend play out. So um, spring is generally when we start to kick the tires pretty hard. Okay. 
Awesome. Um, and one question came from the audience. The, with the inflationary costs um, and concerns, has that affected your pricing strategy at all this season? Then we'll maybe start with you. Um, I think, I mean, with inflation pricing, um, I think there are always going to be difficult conversations there. Um, I mean, Walmart operating off the EDLP, everyday low price principle, um, we're always trying to offer the lowest price possible. Um, that's why we try to operate on the lowest cost possible. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, I think there have been some difficult, you know, discussions uh, across different suppliers and partners. And, and the reality is, you know, we're working with those suppliers to get their products in our stores um, and they're working with us to help sell their products. So. Um, while sometimes it, you know, those may be difficult discussions and inflation is difficult for everyone. And we're all, we're all trying to find ways to, to work through it together. Yep. That's right. That's okay, right. great. Um, another question from the audience. So will the national school lunch policy changes affect purchasing for parents? Do you think? It's interesting. I can't really uh, give a, a, a point of view on that one, Katie. I think it's interesting as you think about just the day to day routine of getting your kids ready with lunches, but um, I'm not familiar enough with that one to, to give a, a strong yeah. answer. No problem. Um, I, and our last I would say I think it's more so going to have an impact on the kids. I think some of those families where who, who are really taking advantage of that program, um, you know, I think the, the parents may have limited bandwidth to, to provide some of those meals in the first place. So is school is really filling that void. Um, so I think that the students will feel the impact. I'm, I'm not sure how that will be seen at, at the home. But yeah, great. Problematic. All right. And our last question, we will make sure that it is TikTok related. Um, so do you think that rush talk will affect Gen Z purchasing behaviors? And I will have to say that as the audience asked that question, I had to very quickly Google rush talk on my laptop here. Um, but for anyone who does not know what rush talk like myself did not know. So the University of Alabama students post their outfits of the day on TikTok during rush week. It is fascinating. Um, Ben, Rick, oh. any thoughts on rush talk affecting Gen Z purchasing behaviors? Have you heard? Katie, of rush I am talk? familiar. I'm familiar with this one. My my son, um, he's a university student. He's in a fraternity, and I was getting TikToks from his uh, fraternity brothers that just popped up on my screen, and they were detailing what they were wearing. <laughs> I did get quite the kick out of it. I think, without a doubt, and I, I think that's where you start to see the power of TikTok to influence smaller communities. And, you know, the, the trick is going to be, how do you truly influence that? And I think it has to be authentic, great mm -hmm. quality on trend. And you just have more opportunities now for organic end users to get around a product and amplify that message with their communities. And it's, uh, it, it's, it's very exciting, but it's also, a little more difficult for us as marketers yeah. to be as precise as we want to be. Right. It's, it's yeah. very interesting. So Ben, I don't know if you have any points on rush talk, but uh, <laughs> I mean, not, I not rush talk school. specifically. <laughs> yeah. I, I think it just speaks to the, the, the larger trend at hand with these younger generations really leaning into, to these platforms and, and, I think you make a great point, Rick, about how it cascades down to each individual community may play out differently. Um, but if you can kind of ladder that up to what is the, you know, the 30 foot view, or 30,000 foot view trend here versus, you know, how does this actually play out in, in my local community? That may give us some guidance. Um, but I only expect this to, this to continue, to be honest with you. So, um, We'll, we'll, we'll see what the next trend is. may not be rush talk, but something else. Hashtag Bama Rush. Um, thanks, Emily Barnes, for educating us there in the chat. <laughs> so it would be interesting to see if that trickles to high schools, Katie. Yep, absolutely. Um, in the fall, so. Yeah. 
So unfortunately, we are out of time. So Ben and Rick, thank you so much for joining me today. This Absolutely. was some fantastic research, really fantastic discussion. Thank you, everybody in the audience for joining us. And we will see you next time. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Katie. Thanks for having us. Thank you. <laughs>